Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. Our second talk, we have Rachel Bunder. Rachel Bunder has been programming for over 10 years and has been using Python for five years. She's a data scientist and an organizer for Sydney Python and Sydney Pi Ladies. Rachel enjoys making big booms with Napoleon artillery pieces, creating things with her hands and playing with data. Um, please welcome Rachel and her talk, I Wish I Learned That Earlier. Thank you for the introduction. So, me right now, I'm a data scientist at a place called Solar Analytics. I work out when solar panels aren't working. I use Python every day for my work and I run a lot of side projects in Python as well. And I organize Sydney Python and Sydney Pi Ladies. So I'm fairly immersed in Python. But me five years ago, I just finished my bachelor's in mathematics and computer science. I was about to start a PhD. I had done lots of bits of programming, like I'd done a bit of C and Fortran and Pascal and Literate D, if you've ever heard of that. And so I was going to start using Python for my PhD. It's like, it can't be that hard. It's, it's like the others, but with more indents. Um, <laughs> so I, I started coding Python. I would just like start writing code that looked Python-ish to me. And if it didn't work, I'll look up what to do. And so I found Python really wasn't that hard. It, it's indents. You just remember indents everywhere. Um, but it, it has some differences. Like there's a, that's the case with every language. You have to be aware of the special features. So that's what this talk is. All these special features I never realized until someone's like, oh, didn't you know that? Really? So let's get started. OK, be wary of append. So for lists, I have to do it this way. OK, so say we have a list and we want to append 10,000 random numbers to our list. So classic way, or well not classic way, but you can use a for loop and append each item individually. Or you could use list comprehension, where you use a for loop inside your list declaration so it makes the whole list all at once. Um, this is much nicer list comprehension. Partly it just looks nicer. Um, it's also a fair bit faster. So it takes roughly 1.41 milliseconds compared to 2.08 milliseconds to do it. It's also less memory intensive. <coughs> Um, I have embarrassing stories about using up something like 96% of the memory of a server that had 64 gigs of memory <laughs> um, by doing, uh, yeah, that list comprehension uses less memory. You have lots of tricks with list comprehension. Um, you can put if statements in them. So same kind of example before, but we only want to include um, even random numbers. So we can have an if statement in our for loop, or we can have an if statement in our list comprehension just here. Um, in this case, it's not so much of a speed difference. Can't tell you about the memory usage. Um, it, it still looks nice. So when you start doing multiple if statements with lots of ands and elses, that's starting to get messy. You probably should avoid that if you can. Um, you can also use comprehension on dictionary sets, and that's cut off, oh well. So same sort of deal. So for dictionaries, you can um, use the curly brackets like normal dictionaries, and you put a for loop, and the i is the key, the random dot random is the value, straightforward. Sets is a similar thing. You just have one number instead of a key value pair. Um, and in the timings in this case, dictionaries, you're much better off doing the normal way. You're much better off going through the loop and putting one item in at a time. Well, better off if you really care about timing. It might be clearer to do it as comprehension. Readability is important. Um, but with sets, sets much better to try and create a set all at once. I suspect it would be about the same as um, setting a list in this case. OK, next thing. So that is an underscore right at the top of the screen. <laughs> so you might have noticed I was using the underscore. And when I went to my first Python meetup, I was like, what's this underscore doing in these people's code? I, I don't understand this underscore. So I went home and looked it up. And I actually looked it up on my phone in the middle of the presentation. And I'm like, what does the underscore do in Python? So I found this Stack Overflow comment. The first two points are saying, oh, it's something to do with C and 
C type things. I, I don't do that sort of stuff. But number three is the important bit. The general purpose throwaway variable. Um, you use it when you say, I don't care what this value is, I just need to do things 10,000 times. Um, so, for example, this. We have our underscore there. <coughs> okay, else statements in Python. So, else, it works like every other language, more or less. You can have if something, do stuff, else if, do some more stuff. Otherwise, else, do more stuff. That, that's fine, that's normal. But then Python starts putting else statements on the end of for loops. Um, so how this works, um, not too surprisingly, it prints out um, the values from zero to four and then it prints out else. Okay, how's that useful? So the useful bit is that if your loop breaks unnaturally, like with a break statement, it doesn't execute the else. So you use the else when you want stuff that want to execute stuff, but only when you finish the loop properly. Um, it also works with while loops. So to show, same deal. And you also have else statements with exceptions. So if I'm trying to divide by zero, I, I try, and it tells me can't divide by zero. And since the exception got executed, the else statement doesn't. Uh, when we have something that you can do, like 10 divided by 2, so no exception is triggered, um, it then executes the else statement. Hey, right, with, with statements. Um, so when reading in a file, you have to open the file, do stuff with the file, close the file. Um, everyone has to do that. So why not make a whole structure to take care of it for you? So with, the with statement, you open the file and save it as I file in this case. You do stuff with the file, and then when it leaves the scope, when the indent stop, the file automatically closes for you. The, um, op the file class type has an open and close function which the with statement works out and executes it all for you. Um, so it's clear a way of showing when you're using the file, it's, it's nice. Okay, sorry for all this stuff cut off the top. There is a package for everything. So say we're reading in a CSV file. I was reading in a lot of CSV files. I was tabbed limited files actually, I was reading in. And so you, I would open a file, I would use the with statement because I've learned about the with statement now. And so for each line in the file, I'll split the line up based on the tabs and then append these tabs to an array and keep on doing that. Um, and then I learned about the CSV reader package. And so this does this all for you. It autom you read in a file, it automatically splits the door, has nice screens where you can iterate over it. It's just nice to use. Oh, it's nicer to use. Um, and a special mention to pandas. Pan pandas is wonderful. Um, it, you can, so it obviously reads in a CSV file. It does a whole lot of other things. If you do any data analysis, look at pandas. I'm not going to talk any more about pandas today because I could talk about it a lot. Um, and so for some timings, reading in the file manually, like doing all the splits yourself, is actually a fair bit faster. I think this might be a Python 3, Python 2.7 change because 2.7, it used to be faster. I'm 100, well, not 100% 100 sure, 90% sure. Um, but at the moment, the uh, CSV package is a fair bit slower, but Pandas is faster. So look at your applications, look how important timing is. Um, pack this package is for everything, but they might not always be better, is the other take home. Okay, so everything is also an object in Python. So say we have a function. This function does something with random numbers. We don't care what it does with random numbers. The problem is we don't know what type of random number we need in this function. It, ch it changes. So we can pass it a random number function to use. So if I want to have just a random uniform number between 0 and 1, I can pass it the random.random .random function. Note the lack of the brackets at the end. Because this just passes the function. And now inside this um, does something with random numbers function, it executes that function and returns a random number. 
Uh, you can also, so if you have your own defined function, so I have my own random number, which my random, which just gives you either zero or one, rounds the number. And I can do the same thing. I can tell it to give me this number, and if I keep on executing, you can see it's either zero or one. Okay, so rounding. Talking about rounding. This is something I only learned about two months ago. And it shocked me. Okay, five, round 5.5. What's, what's the answer? Six. Great, Python agrees with you. Um, round 3.5. See, okay, so we've got people saying three and we've got people saying four. And this is, this is the problem. Python will... Man. <laughs> What am I doing? Oh, okay. Okay, I know what I did. I was changing slides. Don't change slides immediately before because these have been flipped, ar flipped around now. What have I done? Let's do, let's do a better example. Okay, 6.5. So normally people in primary school maths get taught 6.5 rounds up to 7. We always round up. In Python, you round to the nearest even number. <laughs> okay, this is apparently the IEEE standard on floating point stuff. Um, I, I gave this talk to a bunch of mathematicians last week. Their, their reaction was fun. Um, <laughs> so be, be careful. I, I found this out. I have a whole lot of research that is based on rounding numbers. This is terrible, but I, apparently I... I, I define my own rounding function so I was safe. Okay, rounding. Okay, so look up once, save time. Um, I talk about timing a lot because a lot of my code takes um, days to run. Um, no fault of mine, it just does. Um, so going back to list comprehension, this is the same comprehension I was talking about earlier, making random numbers in a list. Um, but what we can do, instead of going random.random, .random, so that goes to the random library and looks up the random function, we can save random.random .random as a local variable. And so that means rather than looking in a library and finding a function, it just looks right there and it's there and it's much faster. So you can see it's 1.31 milliseconds compared to 888 nanoseconds. So it depends on what you're doing if it's better or not. Um, but what's really the best way of doing it is using this um, from random, import random as random2. So that's nearly exactly the same as saving it as local variable. It's much, it's much more Pythonic. People understand what you're doing. It's pretty much no difference in time either. Okay. Generator functions. So generator functions, what these things do so take a very simple example, instead of, we have a function, and instead of returning a value, we yield a value. So yielding means that the generator function says, okay, we yielded a value, I'm going to remember where I was at and what values everything was, and next time this function is called, I'm going to go to the next yield. So to take this example, so it's going to yield one, two, then three, and here I've told it to give me the next of each of the gen generator, and so it'll give me one, two, and three, and then it'll give me an error message because I haven't got anything else to yield. Um, and so you can also have a loop, which will print out one, two, three, because it accesses everything in the yield until there's nothing less left. Um, so finite generators are not entirely exciting, but you do have infinite generators. So we take this example as get primes. So this is our generator function. So it says if um, prime is a number, yield that number. Is if number is a prime, I should say, increment the number. And so if we run this, it will give us the first two primes, two and three, which is nice because we've only caught it twice. And we can continue. We can add as many as we want. And it gives us more and more primes. It's obviously not something you want to do is a four i in get primes because then your, your computer would not stop running for a bit. Infinite primes. So if you want to know about more about generator functions, I found Jeff Nupp's blog extremely useful and lots of examples. 
Okay, so collection classes. When I was writing this talk, I was going to people, I was going to Sydney Python meetups and friends I have and saying, I've got this idea for a talk and what things do you wish you learned earlier? It's a really great conversation starter at a Python meetup. And because everyone would be like, oh, my, my life changed when I learned about collection classes. And I'm going, what, what are collection classes? I've never heard of these things. <laughs> this was a year ago now when that happened. <laughs> so quick introduction to all the collection classes. Um, named tuples. So this is like a tuple, but the um, elements in the tuples can have names. So we have to import it from the collection class. We can say, oh, give me a name tuple that we're going to call point, and it's going to be of type x, y point, and the values in it are going to be x, and it's going to be y. So I can then say, well, p1 is point with 1, 2. So then if I print type, you can see it's type x, y point. If I print p1, x, p1, y, it gives me 1, 2. You can also access it like a normal tuple using the um, square brackets. Um, if we try to say p1x equals 5, it shouts, us up, shouts at us because tuples are immutable and so you can't change the values. Uh, I've got one more thing. Um, so one reason why you would use named tuples is as um, if you're going to inherit from it, make your own class, it makes things a bit nicer. <sighs> okay. That says dex at the top. So dex or double-ended queues, the documentation says it's pronounced dex. So I'm going to believe, well, it must be then. <laughs> so double-ended queues are like lists, but they're made more efficient. So you can append things, or more efficient to append things from either end. So if we go back to my append list example, if we do exactly the same thing for our deck, and just the comprehension, for example, or for comparison. So you can see um, that's, that's a list, and that's a comprehension, oh, a deck, not too much in it, and comprehension is still faster. But if we, why is it cutting off? Okay, nothing important at the top. Um, if we append from the left, we can see that the decks are much faster, or oh, not much, but 1.3 compared to 1.86. Um, no, well, that's the time it function does magic stuff and sorts it all out. So it's the um, it adjusted amount of loops to do depending on how fast it takes. Yes, time it function is one of the things that you should know about too, but I don't talk about it in my talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have it everywhere, so I'd hope you go and look it up yourself. Um, where decks come in really nicely is that you can define the maximum amount of items to be in your deck. So if I say I'm going to create a deck, it's going to be the numbers from one to, or 0 to 99, but it's going to have a maximum length of 10, then my deck will end up being just the 10 last numbers added to it. So in this case, 90 through to 99. And if we continue adding things to this, to this deck using append, you can see that the first one keeps on getting dropped off. So it's like a um, limited queue, I think. Yep. Okay, counter class. So the counter class counts, surprisingly. Um, if we give it a list of values, it essentially gives us a dictionary with the counts of how often each thing occurred. So we can update this counter, so I can add, if you put a string in, it will break it down by the characters. Um, you can give it another list, it'll be fine. Um, and then you can access the individual counts just using the square brackets like a dictionary. Um, all the dictionaries. So dictionaries in Python, if you put in a val if, when you put in values, it doesn't remember the order. It just it takes its hash function and gives you. And when you tell me print the diction, tell Python to print the dictionary, it will print it in whatever order it likes. Um, or the dictionary, it actually remembers what order you input stuff in. So, for example, this we first put in a, the key a, then the key v, then the key five, and when we print it out, we get a v five. It's nice. 
So a default dictionary, this is what in particular changed my friend's life apparently. <laughs> so a dictionary, normally with a dictionary, if you say, give me what dictionary Rachel is, and going, you haven't told me what Rachel is, I, I'm going to throw an error because I don't know what it is. Default dictionary says, oh, well, I have a default value. So we say, give me something I don't know about, I'm just going to give you the default value. So we define default dictionary here. We're going to say the default thing is an int. And so when we access something we don't know about, say my default dictionary B, it returns an int, the, re the default value for an int is zero. Um, we can define our own default, so you have to pass it a function to, for the default value. So if I have a default value function that returns high, when I access something it doesn't know about, it will say high. Okay, so that, that's it for collection classes. Okay, so Python enhancement proposals. So Python is a community effort. If people want to add things to Python, um, they write a proposal saying, I think this is a great thing to add to Python. So you might have seen some talks about um, jitting, jilting. Can't remember what it is, but that's a new, pr um, new proposal that's gaining traction for making things better. Um, so these are all available online. So you have the Python PEP, um, PEP8 is the Python style guide. It tells you things like don't use um, tabs, use spaces, um, naming conventions, things like that. It's worthwhile to look, especially if you haven't done a huge amount of Python before and you want to see what nice Python code looks like. But things like common features like list comprehensions is um, PEP202. I, I think they got added in Python 2.4, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, dictionary comprehensions was a later PEP. The with statement was one simple generator, um, generator. So you can also see PEPs that got rejected and why they were rejected. So it, it's interesting reading if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, doc strings. So when you define a function or a class in Python, you can add, I've got an example, directly below if you do in three um, apostrophes, you can add a doc string. So this doc string tells you what this function is about. So there's lots of Python packages that will go through and look at all the doc strings and say, well, I'm going to automatically generate all your documentation because of course you've documented your code properly already. Um, and you can access it through your function name dot underscore underscore doc underscore underscore. Okay, Jupyter Notebooks, or IPython Notebooks as they used to be called. They now support Ruby and R and maybe some other things. So Jupyter Notebooks are great. This whole presentation was done in Jupyter Notebooks. That's why I can compile code as I'm talking. Uh, it's also, I, I, I'm a data scientist, I do a lot of pictures and looking at big arrays of data. So it's nice because I can have all my ideas written down, I can see all my plots, it's, all, it's a nice environment. Okay, so to conclude, nearly at the end, I found out a lot of these things by getting involved in the Python community. I had moved to Sydney, I didn't know anyone really in Sydney, so I started going to Python meetups, as you do. And at least for the first year, nearly every night, even if the talks were completely out of my interest or skill set, I picked up on little things like this that oh, I wouldn't, would not have known otherwise. And as I said at the beginning, just going up to meetups and saying, what do you wish you learned earlier? People often have really passionate ideas, passionate about something, and you, you learn a lot that way. Okay, well, thank you for listening. Um, enjoy some crocheted pythons. Um, <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter at uh, duckismyfiend. I don't really post much, but you can follow me on Twitter. And thank you once again. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for that insightful talk. Uh, we now have some time for questions. Anybody want to go first? Uh, yeah, I'll just go to the back. Hi, thanks for that. Um, I've got a couple of quick ones. Firstly, is there a round function that does the right thing? Um, I <laughs> or would you just add 0.5 and cast it to an int, which will work? There's someone who just really put up their hand quickly, like they have an answer. 
I'm, I have heard in NumPy, I think there's a proper round function on the scikit package, or he's shaking his head at me. Uh, in the standard library. In the standard library? In the standard library. Um, yeah. I'm not on the microphone, so I'll have a look. Okay. okay. Um, but there's actually multiple methods of rounding in the world. Um, yeah, there's like financial rounding that they like and other types of rounding, and they're all defined in this, in this theme. Okay, so... If you really need to know about rounding, then you need to go and look about rounding. All right, I'll Google it. Okay, uh, so... And the other, the quick yeah. one, um, the other one is, is there a named tuple equivalent that's mutable? So like for a quick class where all you really want is getters and setters? Not that I know of, off the top of my head. Um, dictionary? <laughs> um, also, just to jump back to rounding very quickly, I, I looked this up directly before the talk to make sure I got it right. Wikipedia has a page on rounding. There was about six different types listed. It tells you all what, what the good things and the bad things and if they're IEEE standards and things like that. Um, there's also, I think in Python, I, I've heard that in one of the earlier versions of Python, they round properly by default, but that probably means you have to use Python 2.1 or something, which <laughs> has its own set of problems. Um, in relation to the, the, the mutable named tuple, you make a dict class that has an overwritten uh, dunder get atter <laughs> to look up the dict. Okay. Thanks for that. I was glad to see uh, name tuples and collections get shout out because they're two of my favourite things. Um, you didn't cover uh, stuff like properties, and I guess that's because you like that is well covered in terms of uh, introductory, like introductory material to Python. So, can you just clarify what you mean by properties? Um, not properties, the, the at things that you put above functions. Oh, decorators. Decorators, that's okay, it. Okay, <laughs> so I haven't included decorators partly time, partly I haven't fully understood them myself yet. I, I, I've tried to understand decorators a few times. I, I am preparing a slightly longer version of this talk in which I'm going to get decorators sorted. Um, Yes, decorators are something you should all know about, but don't ask me about them yet, please. <laughs> Hi, Rachel. Hi. Um, I wish to follow up with the rounding problem, actually. So you have in the math uh, standard library two round alternative rounding functions, one which is, uh, which is uh, sealed and the other one that is floor. And mm. this also is available in uh, NumPy, these yep. two. And what they do is basically they take the floor is the lowest integer value and seal the next greater integer value. And I think that the difference between Python 2 and 3 is that in Python 2 it returned the float and now Python 3 returns an integer directly. Okay. Uh, so my question was how is that you had uh, work around that problem or fixing that problem in your uh, code? Because you mentioned that most of yeah, your work so was based I, on that? In my, in my code that I was using for research and had publications based off, um, <laughs> I actually had defined rounding as the number plus 0.5 flawed. The reason is because I didn't actually round properly all the time. Sometimes I did number plus random number flawed, which is why I was that's how I actually discovered about everything is a, um, everything is an object and you could pass functions in. So I was passing different random functions in. So that, that's how I avoided it, because I had coded it from scratch myself for other reasons. Okay, yeah. any more questions? Nope. Okay, well then uh, to conclude, uh, Rachel, I'd like to present you something on behalf of PyCon 2016. Uh, thank you for your talk. Oh, thank you. <laughs>